Good morning. All right, we are in Psalm 22 today. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will read the scripture for the day. Father God, um, please calm us and uh, soften our hearts as we come to your word. Help us to see you, your character, your gracious will, um, your amazing holiness and justice that you put on display for us in your scripture. Help us to understand it better and submit to it. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and read Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my joint bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. God's word to us today in the book of Psalms. All right. Amazing psalm. A lot there. I'm not going to be able to hit everything, but there is much, 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 much we could say. But let's observe first. We see that the psalmist, which is David, um, asks why God has forsaken him and relates how he cries for help and has not been answered. He reminds himself that God is only... I'm sorry, he reminds himself that God is holy and has delivered his fathers and they were not put to shame when they cried out to him. 
He tells of the scorn, despising, and mocking he receives because of his delight in God. He reminds himself that God has been with him from birth. In 12 through 15, he uses vivid metaphors to describe his circumstances and experience. In 16 through 18, um, he describes how his hands have been pierced, his garments divided by the evildoers who encircle him and gloat over him. And then he tells of um, how he will praise the name of the Lord because um, he has been saved. He describes how um, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise him. That kingship belongs to the Lord and that all the families of the nation will worship, of the nations will worship before the Lord. And that everyone who dies will bow, will, um, bow to him, right? So all who go down to the dust will bow before the Lord. And then posterity, right? Time moving forward shall serve him. And he will be told of to the coming generation. And what will be said is that he has done it, right? He has done it. So I suppose the question for us is what has he done? What has he done? So, um, all right. So if there was ever, if there was ever a Psalm that we can be sure has prophetic reference, references to Christ, it would be Psalm 22. In fact, we know in Matthew 27, 46, Christ himself applies this psalm to himself as he is dying, as he's being crucified. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's one of the last things he says before he dies. Um, so we can be sure that Christ himself was applying this psalm to himself, so we should be reading the psalm with Christ in mind. And this psalm starts with a call and response kind of section where the psalmist is um, dialoguing with his own heart, right? He's having a dialogue between the despair of his situation and what he knows to be true about God, right? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you, for, why are you so far from saving me? My God, I cry, but you don't answer. I find no rest. This is the despair speaking. This is the way the situation feels. But it's important to note that that is not the reality of the situation. And the psalmist knows this. As, as Christ also knew this when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a reference to this psalm. And if we only look at that line, we would think, well, Christ believed that God forsook him? And now, while there was an aspect that God did withdraw from him, his presence was not there, God did not forsake him. Christ is referring to this psalm, and we need to take this psalm in its entirety when we um, examine the uh, reference of Christ to the psalm. And what the psalmist is doing here is saying, this is how it feels, but this is what is true. The way it feels that God has forsaken me, that he's not answering me, that I find no rest, yet you are holy. Our fathers trusted in you, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were rescued. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. And of course, here the psalmist is referring back to, I mean, a, a, a whole host of sustaining actions and movement that God uh, used throughout Israel um, from, of, of course, not killing Adam and Eve right away when they sinned to the redemption of Israel from Egypt and the Exodus 
And then all of the book of Judges, when the people would sin and then cry out to the Lord and he would send someone to redeem them. He would send a judge. Right? All of these things throughout their history that are examples that the psalmist is reminding himself. It feels hopeless, but this is who God is. But then again, but, but I'm a worm, I'm not a man. It's this feeling again of hopelessness. Everyone's mocking me for trusting the Lord, right? So it feels hopeless, but God is good. I know this from the past, yet people are mocking me because I trust God. Can I really trust God? Right? He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him, this mocking tone. Um, and this, a worm and not a man, we see in Isaiah 41. Fear, fear not, you worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So even in this reference, there is, um, there will be, you know, God will bring about a redemption even of this reference of, of being a worm. Um, and, and so, again, despair, knowledge counters that argument of despair. Yet experience right now is saying people despise me because I trust in God. Yet I know that, the God, that God has been with me from the womb. People are mocking me because I, I chose God. But I know I didn't choose God. He chose me. You, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Before he was able to choose God, God had chosen him. So please be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. So here's the situation that is set up. This, these are all the feelings that are feelings and thoughts, right, that are swirling in the psalmist's mind. Here's how I feel. Here's what I know. Here's what people are saying. Here's what I know God has said and done. And there's none to help, it seems. We go on and he sets out this situation that he finds himself in. And David uses very vivid imagery in these metaphors to describe the situation. Um, as we read through this, it's kind of shocking. It's easy to just read through and not think about it. When you think about it, it's it's devastating, actually, to imagine this. Of course, many bulls encompass me, strong, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. I mean, this would be a terrifying situation. <laughs> Surrounded by bulls who want to kill you. They open their mouths at me, wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. That's, that's terrifying as well. But it goes on. I'm poured out like water. This imagery is almost too vivid. It, all, and all my bones are out of joint. Have you ever had the experience where someone gave you something heavy, so heavy that you didn't know that you would be if you'd be able to even stand up under its weight. And there's this feeling, maybe I'm the only one who's experienced it, but this feeling of all the strength leaving your body. It's almost like you've been poured out like water. And you feel like you're going to collapse under the weight. There's this draining and you think, I can't, I can't stand up. Um, I'm poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melting within my breast. This hope, hopeless feeling, right? This imagery is so accurate that it's scary. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, right? So imagine I, try, I go and I try to do something and I crumble and I break. As I try to use my strength, the very vessel which should contain my strength is crumbling and my tongue sticks to my jaws. If you've ever been thirsty to the point where you're desperate for water. This experience, you lay me in the dust of death, that dust, that dryness. Dogs encompass me, 
evil doers, do, doers encircle me. And then he goes on to describe what happened to Christ. They have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. So this here is describing what happened to Christ. Hands and feet pierced. I can count all my bones. This experience must have been excruciating on the cross. The pain so complete throughout his body that he's aware of every single part of his structure. So intimate is the pain. They stare at me and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. And it's not just that Christ is aware of this psalm as he's hanging on the cross. He certainly is as he's hanging on the cross. He, he refers to it and he's saying, people, this psalm is about me. But I believe he knew even before that. Imagine, this is the cost of redemption. And Jesus knew the cost. He told his disciples he was going to be crucified and he would rise again. He knew Psalm 22 was about him. This is the cost of redemption. And David is, is showing us far ahead of time the cost of redeeming God's people. So imagine Jesus as he's growing, as, as he's a young man reading Psalm 22, knowing this is where I'm headed. All of this agony is, I'm going here. I'm going here. I'm going to go through this. We often think of Christ's agony as being this, you know, temporary pain on the cross, and then this excruciating agony of the Father separating from it, which is all very much the case. But his whole life is looking forward to this. And, and through it, of course. But imagine a young man reading this and saying, this is where I'm headed. My hands and feet will be pierced. I'll be in such pain that I'll be aware of every bone in my body. They'll stare at me and they'll gloat over me. They're going to take my garments and divide them. And all of this, my strength will leave me. I'll be so thirsty, I can't stand it. Think about that. We fear unknown futures, unknown pain. We avoid it at all costs. He's taking his entire life and using it to move towards this pain. And through it to glory, of course. And it's through it to glory that I think is, I mean, clearly that's the hope. And though we do avoid pain at all costs, there are times when we actually embrace pain because we see a benefit to it. Exercise is a good example. Denying ourselves certain foods that we, we love because there's a, a benefit, right? Um, working hard because there is a financial benefit. All of these things are ways in which we do work through pain because we see a reward. And Christ sees this and he sees the reward beyond it. And so he knows it's not hopeless. The pain is not the end. He will move through this. It's going to be excruciating. It's going to be torment. But he will take that cup. He will drink that cup because the Lord has said it before him and there's glory on the other side. And we thank God that he has done it because 19 through 31 are the outworking of it. Because of Christ's work, we can praise God. We are called the offspring of Jacob <laughs> because of faith in Christ. Even Jacob himself was only, um, was, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were only um, called God's people because of Christ and looking forward to Christ. It's because of Christ's work that God has not hidden 
his face. He's heard us. Christ is the evidence that God has heard us when we cried out to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows will I perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. This is the blessing, the outworking of Christ's accomplishment, his work completed on the cross. And then we see that the glory set before him is his. It is, it is his due. All of the earth, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, coming together. It doesn't say every single person of every single nation, but it says all the families of the nations, right? So there will be people before him who turn to him from all people groups. It's not just Israel. However, what does apply to every single person who has ever lived is that Christ is their king. Kingship belongs to the Lord. The nations, he rules over them. Everyone who dies will stand before the Lord and bow to him. Hopefully, having placed their faith in Christ and receiving the benefit of the work he's done. But posterity, all time moving forward, will serve God and serve Christ and bring glory to him because of the wonderful work he has done. So what we need to remember is that he has done it. He has finished the work. Right? He has done it. It's interesting. He says it is finished on the cross. Right? He has done it. It's finished. He, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everyone listen up. Like, Pay attention. The psalm is about me. And this is what I'm going through. And then he says it is finished. He has done it. Tell everyone about this. It says, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That is what we are supposed to do to communicate that he has done it. It is finished. There is a redeemer and he has done the work. Just as God provided redemption for the people of Israel from their slavery and from their oppression, he has heard the cry of his people, a cry to be freed from death. Everyone has cried that, that cry of, of despair. And he has heard it, and he has sent a redeemer, and he has done the work, and it is finished. You need to tell people. Posterity shall serve him. We need to serve him through posterity, through communicating what he has done. My conclusion for today is that our hearts are prone to doubt and despair, but the knowledge of God's character and his track record of faithfulness should remind us that he has provided for us in the most complete way possible. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Christ. Thank you that you sent him to redeem us and that despite our great and grievous sin against you, you have made a way for us to be right with you, to save us from the most pressing need we have. Help us to not take that lightly, to remember what you went through to accomplish the work and to communicate the fact that it is finished, that you have done it to those around us and to future generations. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I'll see you again.